Hello, book two. It was brought to my attention the other day that I apparently have never done a starter kit on this channel for the gays, uh, which is really unacceptable. <laughs> and uh, and I did a cursory search of my own videos to see if that was true. Couldn't find anything. So I thought I would at least partially rectify that today. This is a partial starter kit for the gays. It's going to deal in fiction and for gay men. So I'm not dealing with anything else on the, the spectrum there. Just, just gay men this time around. And when you're talking about works of art in general, fiction just specifically, for that sort of thing, you have to keep in mind that for most of its existence on Earth, male homosexuality was reviled, uh, mocked, penalized, uh, repressed, very much repressed. And so, if you yourself were gay, you if, if you were driven to express yourself, you had to take some circuitous routes to do that. So the, you, and that status changed over time uh, with gradually greater visibility and social profile, a marginally patchwork, uneven, stumbling steps towards some kind of acceptance, pockmarked along the way by repressive red legislation, by uh, increasing international awareness of how the law isn't the same in every country, and also of a plague that seemed at first to target gay men, specifically and ruthlessly, and that, I think, defined an entire generation of gay men. And so when we're looking at our books and our starter kit, instead of it just being, you know, 10 or 11 books that I'm just going to reel off, I want to group them under categories of social response, the kind of social tectonic pressure that gave rise to the books in the first place. And the, the big, broad category here is going to be repression and allegory, which has existed forever and which has often been the case that gay men who were not out to their family, they were not out to their wives or to their children, they could not be because for most of the time that we're talking about it would have been a criminal offense. It would, even if you weren't caught in flagrante directo, directo and sent to prison for hard labor, uh, you would still be a social outcast for the rest of your life. You, and so if you want to write, often you, it is under terms of repression and therefore must take the place, the, the form of allegory. So we're going to do a f just a handful of books that way, uh, that either express repression outright or that, uh, or that deal in allegory. And the first one that we'll, we'll deal with is Billy Budd for Topman by Herman Melville, which is... It's in all of the Melville anthologies. It always has been. It was, it was widely read in his time. It is, in other words, an extremely effective allegory. I doubt that you will ever read a work of comparable erotic longing, the intensity of erotic longing that is in this story. And yet, because it's a very well done allegory, it can easily be read, readily be read as something that has nothing to do with, with gay love at all. I strongly recommend it. <laughs> just uh, just uh, take the, the blinders off, and I strongly recommend it. Then we can deal with uh, another kind of necrotic repression, both on the reflected in the story and on the part of the author. This is Death in Venice by Thomas Mann, which definitely belongs on a starter kit, but it is... I think you'll, you'll probably know the outline of the story. It is definitely not a healthy story. One of the threads that runs throughout a lot of what we'll be talking about in this starter kit is that lack of health, which is a direct product of social repression. If you are taught from the, the minute that you can string two thoughts together that a certain class of people is repulsive and repressed and mockable, uh, instant social outcast, uh, sinful, sinful, destined for hell. If you're taught that from the minute that you can think straight, and then 10 years later, you suddenly slowly realize that that is you. Well, you're going to come up with a book like Death in Venice. It's, it's beautiful. One of the most beautiful things on the list. Uh, and then the, the next one for repression and allegory here is not allegorical at all. It's completely straightforward, but it is nevertheless the product of repression because the author wrote it in the complete honesty of his heart and then knew that he couldn't publish it, had to wait until he was dead. And that's Morris 
by E.M. Forster, which is a straightforward love affair, a straightforward love story between two men, but Forster knew that he couldn't publish it in his own lifetime, and so he didn't. <laughs> uh, but when you get social pressure like that, that tectonic pressure weighing down on people, and some of those people are artists, in addition to allegory, in addition to resorting to telling stories without telling them, like, for instance, all of the 19th century novels about uh, dewy, ingenue young women going to Venice and being seduced by gondoliers, for instance. In quite a few of those stories, it, it's the the author of the story is not identifying with the gondolier, let's just put it that way. They're doing what they can under the massive tectonic pressure that's being applied to them. But there's another way to uh, to deal with that kind of pressure, and that is to write fantasy. To imagine a sanctuary. Imagine a paradise where those pressures aren't there anymore. And then write, live for a little while as an author in that world and give your readers a chance to live in that world. And uh, again, plenty of people, plenty of writers have done that. I want to show you just a handful for this starter kit. So a lot of these books will be familiar from time spent on this channel. First one, of course, is the most boisterous. This is The Lord Won't Mind by Gordon Merritt, in which two extremely handsome, extremely virile young men come together under the loving and, and uh, allowing eye of a kind of blousy, auntish figure that crops up often in this kind of sanctuary novel, the blousy auntish figure who is too rich and too eccentric to care about the stupid strictures of the world. So just be yourselves, darling. <laughs> that figure crops up everywhere in gay literature, everywhere. And it outlasts even the repression, or it follows the repression wherever the repression goes. Like, for instance, a lot of you will know the movie Latter Days about a Mormon, a closeted Mormon, who falls in love with a young man. And there's there it is. There's the blousy auntish figure right in there who's wealthy enough and eccentric enough not to care what the world thinks. And so can give sanctuary to two young gay men. Uh, that happens in this book. A lot of other things happen in this book. And it it is written in a way that is just weird. You just don't imagine when you're reading it if you're reading it and thinking and just shutting out the outside world, you can't imagine the outside world what it was doing to young gay men at the time. You just It's a total fantasy of sanctuary and paradise. Same thing with this next one, which is once was Once Upon a Time, by far the most popular example of this kind of sub-response to the, the pressure that I'm talking about. Maybe it still is. This is 28 Barbary Lane by Armistead Mopane, in which a whole bunch of gay people fall under the loving care of a blousy auntish figure. Or is it a blousy uncle figure? <laughs> Let you be the judge. Uh, but they, the, the location, uh, lot, some of you who are of a certain vintage will remember the miniseries, or there was there two or three miniseries. The location becomes a kind of paradise, a place where you can be accepted. Uh, 28 Barbary Lane and its 8 million sequels are not good. On a, on a technical level, the Lord won't mind is not good either. It's the, That wasn't the point. The point was to create a world in which the judgment of your peers and your teachers and your uh, your co-workers and your family didn't exist. A world you could that you could go in, unfortunately, in the real world, gay men, when these books were coming out, still had to buy them secretly. Still had to read them secretly, usually. So the pressures were still there, very much. Same thing with this one. This, this last one in this category is very much a sanctuary and paradise novel of the weirdest and most bizarre kind of way. This is Dancer from the Dance by Andrew Holleran, in which there's a judgmental outside world. There's a hayseed hick judgmental world out there, but the world you're drawn into in this book has a whole bunch of other things on its mind. It does not, it is not about that. It does not care about that, so it just it just pulls you in with its own vocabulary, its own urgencies, and a great deal of literary virtuosity. So we're, we're kind of going from pole to pole here because the, the Barbary Lane books don't have any literary virtuosity. They're still enjoyable to read. They're not, this is, is, in some parts, a serious work of literature. It's certainly a young gun serious attempt at literature. <laughs> uh, and then once we're done with 
uh, sanctuary and paradise, then we move into the real world. And there are plenty of authors who did that. There are plenty of authors who, gay authors or people who wanted to write gay stories, who wrote in and about the real world. Sometimes they very much went out of their way to make their novels not sanctuary or paradise. Sometimes they went out of their way to take the repression and allegory of our first grouping and channel it into a darker kind of story. One of the darkest examples is by the greatest writer on this list. This is Yukio Mishima. This is his book, Forbidden Colors. Uh, I don't know if this is still in print, but uh, it's worth finding if it is. It's, a, it's about a main character who weaponizes the gayness of a beautiful young man in order to wreak havoc in a world that has repressed him, in a world that has, that has been had its knives out for him if they only knew. It's a, a dark, angry, extremely unhealthy look at, at the real world. It could, it could probably be in repression and allegory in that category rather than in the real world. I, but I, put, I, wanted, I wanted to make sure that I recommended it to you. And when it comes to the real world and gay fiction, I mentioned a plague. A, a plague happened. A gay plague happened. A virus that killed people. There was no treatment, there was no cure, and there was no great hurry for a cure for a while because of the social stigma involved. There were a great number of evangelicals in the United States and the UK, in Europe. There were a great number of U.S. officials. There was a U.S. president who looked at the AIDS epidemic and thought, well, maybe they've got it coming. Maybe this is, as many evangelicals said, maybe this is God's judgment. And like I said, that that had, I think, an unbelievable, I think it's still underassessed, an unbelievable impact on the gay world, just the gay world in general. I, I know it's pessimistic of me, predictably Irish Catholic of me, but I think the AIDS epidemic had far more of an impact on the gay world than the Stonewall riot. Uh, we could debate about that all day long, but one way or another, when you're dealing with a gay starter kit, you're going to have to deal with AIDS, with books about AIDS. The, the, the writers that it didn't kill, it darkly inspired to deal with the subject. Now, one of them I want to mention here is really good novel. It's not as well known as anything else on this list, but I, I strongly recommend it. It's extremely intelligently done. It's In the City of Shy Hunters by Tom Spanbauer. And that's that's largely what it's about. It's about a you know a golden-haired boy with cheek of tan who comes from the provinces to the big city in the time of AIDS, and uh, it's sprawling. It's not a short novel, but it is wonderfully textured, just wonderfully so. Uh, but it's not all it's not all AIDS in the twentieth century because, of course, as you know, pockets of repression definitely still exists. Repression still exists. Social stigma still exists in large parts of my own country, for instance. A young man gathering his parents and his siblings in the living room and telling them, I will just want to tell you all I'm gay, will be out on the street that night. It's not a minor thing at all. It's still a life-changing decision to make. I would argue not so much. I think the needle has moved quite a bit. But in certain places, in certain times, in certain enclaves, it is still completely unthinkable. In certain cultures, still completely unthinkable for a man to be gay. And a recent book that was lauded everywhere that really captures that well, that belongs on a gay starter kit, is Sugar Bane by Douglas Stewart, which sets you down in a working-class Scottish neighborhood where it is not thinkable, where it, it cannot happen. And it's not just not thinkable to everyone else, it's also not thinkable to our main character. That's the whole point of, of the kind of social repression that I'm talking about, is that it worked inward first, in cruel, horrible ways, in ways that can be traced in a large amount of gay fiction. Whether it's well expressed, or whether it's warped and twisted, and whether it's poisoned the person, so that they hate themselves and everyone else. That uh, This definitely belongs on that list, even though it doesn't deal with, with, uh, with a plague. But we, I want to I wrap up are, this is just a very provisional starter kit for the gays, with, I think, the greatest work of, of gay literature uh, in this third era, this, this third category, the real world, and it very much deals with AIDS. It is uh, Angels in America, the two plays that make up Angels in America, Millennium Approaches and Perestroika, that taken together as a book 
uh, is amazing. Just amazing. There are only two works of literature that I know that equal this in its visceral gut punch. And I couldn't put either one of them on a starter kit because they're not really starter books. You have to be totally sold. You have to be totally all in. With this, if you're not if you're not really uh, much for reading plays on the page, then find the, the DVD or the download or the streaming service or whatever of the miniseries that was made of these two plays together. Find that and watch it. I don't know if the, uh, the rather silly Andrew Garfield Broadway version with Nathan Lane uh, is filmed. I don't know if you can watch that, but try not to. <laughs> try not to. If you can, try to find the version with Meryl Streep. Uh, and Justin Kirk in the main in the main role, and uh, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> if you don't, there's no chance that you won't. You will see what I mean. And Al Pacino is, is in it in a, a role that, admittedly, in the play calls for scenery chewing. Al Pacino is no stranger to scenery chewing. He does a great job, just a great job. So uh, this is I'm going to wrap up the, the the starter kit with Angels in America, even though it is unbelievably grim reading. It's brilliant, but it's unbelievably grim. Uh, and those, that is a starter kit for the gays. It's just fiction. It's not nonfiction. And it, it, we do not stray far afield. These are ten things to start with. Keeping in mind the various seismic pressures that were on the writers. Can I not even allude to this at all? Not in any way. So, in other words, I write Billy Budd. I, because I can't allude to it in any way. I write... Simonetta Perkins. I write a, a novel or a novella where someone falls in love with a man, and I'm not, I'm just daring my readers to guess that it's me who's falling in, who's fantasizing about falling in love with a man. Or am I feeling bitter repression, and I'm going to show that in the work, either by denying its authorship, or by delaying its authorship, or by having the characters in the book hate each other and repress each other? Or am I living in the real world where I, I can definitely make an identity out of this without going to prison or being killed. And now I want to explore that. So I, I can make an identity. It's not an easy one. It's not a universally accepted one. And I'm just now needing to figure out if I am going to walk that path, what novel comes of that? What work of fiction comes of that? Culminating in Angels in America, where you have all of that. To you. All of that comes together in Angels of America, which does a great deal of allegorizing. It has characters that were, that absolutely cannot think that gay people exist or that they themselves might be gay. It has people who are who are openly gay but unbelievably conflicted about it. And it has people who are openly gay and not unbelievably conflicted about it. It has them all. Uh, so that that's your uh, just a brief stab at a starter kit. We'll, we'll have a, a part two and a part three of this, I imagine, down the road. But I couldn't let this lacunae go. This... I couldn't let, this is just a gap. I totally forgot to do a starter kit for the gays, and you can't do that. Gotta always have something for the gays. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, Book 2.